Welcome everyone to Professor John Minter's third virtual talk on Hong Kong literature and translation. Before I hand over to Professor Minter to start the talk, I'd like to remind the audience that after talking for about an hour and a half, Professor Minter will receive questions from the floor. Those who want to ask questions, please type in your question so that Professor Minter will see your question in the chat box. And after the Q&A session, please uh, fill in the evaluation form before you log off Zoom. Now, let's welcome Professor Minter. Professor Minter. Thank you very much for, come, for, for tuning in again. This is the third of my talks on, on, on um, Hong Kong literature and translation. And, um, and as, I, as, as I think will become apparent, this is in fact a re a re recording of the, of the talk because we had some technical problems on July the tenth, but the question and answer session will be exactly as it was on that day. And I thank that my thank my friends at Hang Seng for arranging this. Um, and um, and um, I will I will um, I'm just going to introduce the topic now. I'm going to talk about what I call the survival of BT the BT tradition in, in Chinese literature, the way it survived in Hong Kong as a civilized literature of leisure. And of course, as with all of my talks, this is centered around the, um, the series of books I edited for the Chinese University of Hong Kong Press. And these, the, these are the titles that I'll be talking about today. But I want to begin by asking a very fundamental question, which is, what is literature anyway? We take it for granted, you know, we just keep talking about literature, 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 but what exactly is literature? What does it mean? And how do we arrive at the best kind of literature? These are questions that have occupied the minds, not only of Chinese thinkers, but of thinkers all around the world. And I want to begin by looking at some, some very old Chinese ideas in, about this very question. Starting off with the emperor of Wen of the Wei dynasty and the son of Cao Cao, who wrote um, famously in his in his piece, he wrote that what is of the greatest importance in literature is the great vital breath. In other words, the qi, when yi qi wei zhu, you know, and that the, the, that that qi can be either pure or impure, and you can't force it. This is this is it's like what happens in music. You can have the same song in which the melody and the rhythm may well be harmonious, and in which the tempo and the changes in tempo may be well controlled, but the use of the great vital breath, the qi is different from, from one singer to the next. In other words, this writer um, is saying that the most important thing in, in, in any work of literature is the energy, the chi that went into it, the way the writer channels the chi of the universe to bring it down to earth, if you like, into a work of literature. And um, another very famous writer on literature was Lu Ti, who in his famous Wen Fu, the prose poem on literature also dealt with this issue. And he said, this is a very famous translation by Achilles Fung from, from Harvard. And he, I'll read you the English. Taking his position at the hub of things, the writer contemplates the mystery of the universe. That word xuan, you see, the mysterious. He looks into the darkest secrets of the world, you see. The writer, and this, this is a very traditional Chinese view that the writer has a, almost a sacred function. He's looking into the darkest corners of the whole of human existence. And, and he also feeds his emotions and his mind on the great works of the past. Moving along with the four seasons, he sighs at the passing of time, gazing at the myriad objects, the Wan Wu. He thinks of the complexity of the world. He sorrows over the falling leaves in virile autumn. He takes joy in the delicate, bloods of delicate buds of fragrant spring. With awe in his heart, he experiences the frost. With a solemn spirit, he turns his gaze to the clouds. So, so Lu Ji's picture of literature is, is, is almost a sacred, a sacred one. You know, the writer has a almost like a shamanistic relation to the to the universe. He is channeling. Uh, like 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 Cao Pi said, he's channeling the chi of the universe in his writing. So so literature had a very high a very high position in in Chinese culture. All from the very beginning, the written word was sacred, and um, the great work by Liu Xie, Wen Xin Diao Lung, all takes up this and says literature, and by this 
he's referring to the word wen, which also means civilization. You see, wen ming, wen, the pattern of all aspects of the universe. I mean, wen refers to pattern. It refers to the, um, the, uh, the, the intricate um, design of the universe and of literature. It, is, it has a very great inner power, de. So now uh, Liu Xie is moving on from the idea of qi to the idea of de. And what the Maoris here in New Zealand call mana, it is your it is your inner power, your spiritual power. So in other words, literature consumes a huge amount of human energy. It's very related to the idea of chi, you see. And um, and he goes on to say it's born together with heaven and earth. Well, the Chinese says, you know, you tian di bing sheng de. And why do we say this? And then he goes on to talk about how all the things in the universe, you know, have, have this one, have this quality of one. And these are, all, these are all one, language, literature, culture, indeed the Tao itself. So you couldn't say anything more powerful about literature. Literature is, is the Tao, it is a manifestation of the Tao. So these three words, qi, de, and Tao, are all used to explain what literature is all about, why it's so special, why writers are so important as they have been throughout Chinese culture, throughout Chinese history. If, if there is one civilization in the world that, that, puts, that puts literature on a pedestal, it's, it's, it's the Chinese civilization. And this is very important to remember because it's there, it's there, and it's there in the background all the time. But then of course, in, in, in the present, in the last century, things underwent a huge um, shift because, because of the arrival of, um, of Stalin, Stalinist um, thinking about literature. And in particular, in 1942, when Mao Zedong delivered a very, a very, a very crucial speech in Yenan talking about literature. And his definition, of course, was radically different. Literature must serve the masses, you know. Literature must be something which provides ammunition, if you like, for the revolution. And if it doesn't, it's just simply bad and must be punished for that. And we've got to remember this is at the background of everything that's happened in, in China, in mainland China since the 1940s. And writers who have strayed beyond the bounds of, of what is considered beneficial to the people have paid bitterly for their mistakes, for their ideological mistakes. They have been persecuted, they have been struggled against, and they have suffered enormously. And of course, the key thing about Hong Kong is that it didn't have to go through any of this. Hong Kong was never subject to this kind of ideological um, pressure on writers. And that's crucial. That's why they were able to produce literature, what I call BG Wenxue, the literature of leisure. If you like, it's almost like light literature because they were not being told at the end of at the end of a barrel of a gun, you must serve the people. And if you don't, you're you're counter-revolutionary. They were just left to get on with it. You know, it was what the British call laissez-faire. And I mean, you might not approve of that in all element in all the realms of life, but in literature, it was what it was what created the environment in which um, literature could flourish. Now, within the general realm of literature. Um, what, what is meant by BG literature, BG Wenxue? It's a very particular kind of literature in, in the Chinese tradition. And it, I've just listed here some of the many, many categories of BG, you know, um, the, uh, including, I mean, the highest, in my opinion, the highest point in the history of BG Wenxue would be the Liao Jai Zhiyi, the stories of, of Pu Songning written, you know, in the late 17th, early 18th centuries. And he, he incorporates into that extraordinary book all kinds of stories, anecdotes, sometimes very, very short, almost like newspaper, almost like television news items, you know. It's a very, very broad category, BG. I mean, it literally means notes, you know, just casual notes, you know, sway B. And, and, and um, it encompasses a huge variety. On the, one, on the one end of the spectrum, you've got stories about ghosts, about about fox spirits, you know, Huli Jing and Gui. And then on the other end, on the other level, you've just got a strange, a kind of Zhiguai, just strange goings on, odd, odd phenomena, you know, strange weather events, strange gender, strange, all kinds of odd oddities. So it's a very, very wide category. And it's one of the it's one of the categories of Chinese literature that has been least appreciated in the West, very seldom translated. People have trouble. Um, 
taking it on board. And yet for the Chinese writer through the centuries, it was terribly important. I mean, every Chinese writer of any importance, as well as leaving prose and poetry and maybe drama, would have left hundreds and hundreds of volumes of BT. I mean, take Su Dong Po, for example, a very famous poet from the Song Dynasty. Of course, we read his poetry, we read his, his Si, we read, all, we, we read all that, but he also wrote enormous amounts of BT, um, little accounts, little, little reminiscences, like journal, journal entries. And um, they tend to be um, left, they tend to be neglected, you know, by, by scholars outside of China. But anyone brought up in the Chinese tradition will understand how very important they are. And um, you see, I, I want to put this in a broader, broader um, perspective because in other, in other countries, in other cultures, classics of light literature are, are, are respected and they become, they become very important. And I'm just gonna take you through a few examples of this in English literature at the beginning of the 19th century. And many of these are like the kind of writers that people like me all grew up on, you know. For example, there's a very famous, um, very funny book about history called 1066 and all that. And it was, it was just a, 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 very, a very humorous account of English history by, by um, a two gentlemen called Seller and Yateman. And everybody grew up on it. And many of the, many of the um, articles in it appeared in a magazine called Punch. Now, Punch was a bit like in America, they've got the New Yorker. It was a venue for, for lighthearted, but very well-written um, articles about various things, little sketches. I mean, sketches are a kind of BG Wednesday, you know. And these two gentlemen um, published their book in, in, in bits and pieces in Punch magazine, starting, and then it was finally put together as a book in 1930. And um, this is just a small, the beginning of the chapter 11 talking about William the Conqueror, you see, and it's written in a very, very humorous way. All, all boys would have read it when I was, when I was at school, we all read, and that we had funny illustrations like that, you know. Now, another, another wonderful example of English B.G. Wensway is the lady Beatrix Potter, who every Western, every English child grew up with the stories of Beatrix Potter. She wrote this, for example, the story of Jemima Puddle Duck. Hers were always stories about animals, and she illustrated them herself. And poor Jemima Puddleduck, Puddleduck was very attracted to this gentleman with a long bushy tail, who turns out, of course, to be a fox. And she, she's, she gets into trouble, Jemima Puddleduck. And that's one of many little books that she wrote, which are now considered to be classics, not just of children's literature. I mean, I've reread them recently, and I just think they're so well written very finely written. She had a gift for writing English prose. And Peter Rabbit, of course, everyone's heard of Peter Rabbit. And these are classics of, of I would call them BG Wednesday, you know, BG literature in English. And this is one of her letters, because she was always illustrating her letters with squirrels and rabbits, and she loved nature. She was an amazing person. Another great example is Rudyard Kipling, a really great writer. And he wrote a book called The Just So Stories, and he illustrated them himself. And this is the one about the elephant's child, for example. Again, we all grew up on these stories and they're very well written. This is the one about the rhinoceros. And here's the one about the whale. I mean, I, I can thoroughly recommend these, these stories to anyone who's trying to improve the level of their English because he, Rudyard Kipling wrote superb English. And then we come to perhaps the most famous of them all, A.A. A. Milne. Now, A.A. A. Milne, and not many people know this. He was also the, the deputy editor of Punch. And he wrote, he was a very clever writer. He wrote plays. His plays were very successful. He made lots of money out of them in the West End. But he's most famous for the, the books he wrote for children. Well, the books he wrote for his son, who, who was called Billy Moon in the family, but he, his real name was Christopher Robin, of course. And there's, there's Christopher Robin with his little bear. And he called, he ended up calling the bear Pooh. And here are his other toys. You know, he's got a little, he's got, he's got a little kangaroo, a little tiger. And there he is, one of the illustrations by A. A. Milne's friend, E. H. Shepherd, which became so famous. There he is sitting with, with Winnie the Pooh leaning against his back. And there's Winnie the Pooh's house at Pooh Corner. These are again, things that we all grew up with as children. But the, one, the wonderful thing about them is that they're superbly well-written. A.A. Milne was a, was a good writer, a very, very skillful writer. 
and uh, he became very successful, of course. And um, and there are others of that of that period, like Hilaire Belloc, who wrote cautionary tales for children. Again, Hilaire Belloc was a fine writer, and he he devoted his, his energies to these stories for children, to teach them certain moral lessons. But he was he was fundamentally a fine writer, and he, this is a kind of light literature of enormous quality, and greatly respected in 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 England. And uh, J. M. Barry, of course, wrote Peter Pan. And there's Peter Pan, one of the immortal works of English literature, but very light, very, very, um, almost like throwaway literature, you know, very, very, very much BG, English BG, you know. There's Peter Pan flying through the sky with Tinkerbell and 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 P and, and J. M. Barry was also a very successful playwright and author. And of course, we all know about Lewis Carroll and Alice in Wonderland. I mean, I'm just I'm just flicking through these to make a point that in English in English literature of the of the early ninth of the early twentieth century, um, we had some very fine writers who were writing what I call English B.G. Wensley. Kenneth Graham wrote *Wind in the Willows*, which is a beautiful book, and again he was a very fine writer. So these people were were really um, distinguished literary people who 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 were not ashamed to write light literature, literature of quality. And Walter de la Mer was another one. He, wrote, he also wrote ghost stories. You see, ghost stories in, in, in the West are also a kind of B.G. Wensley. They're a kind of minor branch of literature, but everybody loves to read them. And this is what, uh, this is what Walter de la Mer wrote. All day long, the door of the subconscious remains just ajar. We slip through to the other side, and return again as easily and secretly as a cat. So this is the kind of exercise of the imagination that allows us to enter into the world of, of um, the sketch, the BG sketch, and he was a master of that. Now, to return to Hong Kong, which is after all the topic of my lecture, um, there, are, there is one particular writer who I want to focus on today, who, who is an absolute, she is the queen really of, of Hong Kong BG literature. She's she's a superb writer. Her name is Xi Xi. Well, that's just her pen name. That's her beaming. Um, she's really called Zhang Yen, and she's originally she's a Hong Kong family that was ended up in Shanghai and then came back to Hong Kong uh, just around the so-called Jiefang period. You know when when Hong Kong uh, became a communist state, and um, she trained as a school teacher, a primary school teacher, and then gradually became a full time writer, a very successful full time writer. And um, we, we were the first to translate her work in, at the Chinese University at Renditions, a very famous story of hers called Xiang Wo Jian, the Eager Nudes, A Girl Like Me, which was translated and published in Renditions when I was the editor. And Stephen Sung, who I've spoken about so much, he was the one who introduced me to Xi Xi. He said, you've really got to read this woman's writing. It's superb. And it's very light. It's a very, it's a very, it's very whimsical. Her writing is extremely, um, it's not sort of heavy going, serious writing, but it's deep down, it's very serious. She's a very fine artist. And we published a book of her stories. I'm very proud of this book, very proud of it. It was one of the first books of Renditions Paperbacks, a series which I launched in, in about 1985, 84, 85. And this was a collection of her stories, including uh, A Girl Like Me. But today I want to just give you one example which is in my book, The Best China, uh, in the new series. It's this little piece called The Draw. Now, it's not fiction exactly, there's no story. It's just a kind of sketch. It's just a kind of, what can I say? It's just a piece of BT. And it's, she talks about a draw. I've got a draw, I have a draw. In it, I keep the little things I may need in the course of the day. It's just a casual thing, you know, I've got a drawer. I might as well say I've got a table, I've got a chair, I've got a drawer. What do I keep in it? A few coins, a bunch of keys, a watch, some stamps, a half empty packet of cigarettes. It's only a small drawer. Sometimes I pull it all the way out, tip it upside down and sort everything through. When I do this, there's always a sound of something rolling away, a button or a pencil stub rolling from the desk down onto the floor, from the floor to some unknown place. If I can see it, I pick it up. If I can't, I just let it be. Some things, when they're tipped out of my drawer, don't roll. They just make a sort of clattering sound. 
my cigarette lighter, for example, or that tiny round mirror of mine. I can no longer remember how that little mirror found its way into my house, how it has managed for so long to monopolize that corner of my drawer. I only know that it has become part of my life. Every day without fail, when I open the drawer, I see it there, the little mirror, you see. And the moment I see it, a voice seems to rise from some strange place and utter the words, hallelujah, we're alive. I won't read the whole thing because I haven't got time, but it's, I think you've got some idea. It's a kind of, um, it's, it's, it's not serious in one sense. It's very, it's very frivolous. It's almost trivial, but it's, it's also very, very subtle, very delicate. And it, 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 it conjures up a moment a, 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 what the French call an aperçu, a perception of of life, of the world, which is very, very, um, a very, very, very touching. I mean, if we look at the last paragraph, who am I? Why? I only have to open my drawer, and my ID tells me who I am in great detail. Where do I live? Again, I only have to open my drawer and look into my mirror. Haven't I been living comfortably in my mirror all along? Haven't I been keeping my mirror carefully in the drawer all along? Where am I? In my drawer, of course, that hardly needs saying. As for where I come from, why? I come from the immigration department, of course. And where am I going to? To the registry of births and deaths, of course. It's a very, um, a very lovely piece, and written in very pure Chinese. Uh, so now recently, when I was in Hong Kong a few years ago, I mean, probably about 10 years ago, I was, one, I was wandering through a bookshop. I mean, I, I love browsing in bookshops. It's a terrible habit of mine. I have an enormous number of books and I spend my life trying to read them. Anyway, I just, I just picked up this book by chance called Feng Xiong Zhu. I mean, and I thought that's an odd looking book. I took it home. I didn't read it for a few weeks because I was traveling. And when I sat down to read it, I thought, my goodness, this is a fascinating book. Again, it's a, it's a kind of, you've only got to look at the title and the use of the word Zhu, you know, which is a quite quite a serious word, quite a serious word, in, in in the history of literature. I mean, a jury is a kind of um you know a, a, a record of something and used uh, in, in in the historical records as a kind of monograph about a subject. And so um, this is this is a monograph about stitching together bears. And I thought, what the hell's going on here? And um, now recently, um, thanks to the kind the kindness of CC, I've received all these photographs of her making her bears. And it's a very touching story because she had a bad bout of cancer. And after the um, chemotherapy, she, she needed to train her hands back. I had the same experience after a stroke. You need to get your motor, your fine motor skills working again. And she chose to make bears. And, and the fine stitch work would be a way of learning how to use her hands again. And, um, and then she got more and more involved making these bears. There's her Singer sewing machine, you see. And, and, and she, got, she got deeply involved in making them. And then, and then later she, um, she started making costumes for them, you see. There's, there's one of the costumes. And she took them with her wherever she went. She went traveling in Europe. Here she is in Amsterdam uh, with holding one of her little bears just outside the, right, just outside the big museum there. And uh, anyway, to cut a long story short, I decided it'd be great to translate this book and put it into our series. And I was being a bit, a bit eccentric. I mean, nobody would take it seriously, I suppose, but I, I took it very, very seriously. I, I took it to heart as an example of contemporary Chinese Hong Kong BG Wenshui, you know, some, someone who's had the courage to take a very light subject. I mean, teddy bears, come on, they're not... Who can claim that teddy bears are serious? But then nor is the draw. The draw isn't serious, but he, she manages to turn it into a meditation on life. And the teddy bears, she decided to dress them all up like famous people in Chinese culture and put lovely clothes on them. And then she wrote a little essay about them. Each one had a little essay. And then her brother, her very nice brother, made, took the photographs and they were published. And we've, we, we turned the whole thing into a very beautiful English book. I was very fortunate to be able to recruit a very talented young scholar called Christina Sanderson, who also loves teddy bears and who has exactly that same spirit of charming, whimsical humor and, and devoted you know, a long time to translating this book. And um, 
here, here are, to give you some example, here are some of the characters in the book. This is the, the Queen Mother of the West, Si Wang Wu, and Ho Yi, the archer. And this is the Yellow Emperor, Huang Di. And here we've got Si Shi, the famous beauty is on the right. And, and this is Zhong Li Chun. And this is Zhuangzi, of course. Zhuangzi was one of her favorite characters. And she wrote a long essay about Zhuangzi. I don't think I've got time to read the whole essay, but very beautifully translated. And, um, and then this is Chu Yuan and the mountain spirit, the Shan Gui. This is the famous couple who ran away together, Sima Xiangru and Zhou Wenjun. And this is the great historian, Sima Qian. And here's Tao Zhi and the, Lu, and, and the Lu Shen, the goddess of the Luo River. These are two of the members of the of the Zhu the Zhu Lin Qi Xian, the seven sages of the bamboo grove. The one on the left is Xi Kang, and the one on the right is Ran Xian. Again, I haven't got time to read all of this, but unfortunately, and this is the great calligrapher Wang Xi Zhi. But I, I take it for me, the little essays are charming. It's for me, if I was if I was teaching Chinese, um, I would give this book to um, second or third year students as a way of introducing them to Chinese culture in a very, very delightfully enjoyable way and improving their Chinese, but also giving them pleasure, you know. And this is where the words pleasure, leisure, they all become part of BG Wenxue. I mean, this is just the most delightfully enjoyable book. This is Tao Yuan Ming holding a chrysanthemum, bless him. And she sometimes moved beyond the world of the Han Chinese. And this is Genghis Khan. He, of course, is, is the great Cao Sui Qin, the, the author of Hong Lao Meng. And in her essay, she, she introduces some very useful pieces of information, but in a very light way. There's nothing heavy about the book. It's so light, it's so delicious. And here's, of course, the famous Hua Mulan. And then she gets into some Western stuff. This is Beauty and the Beast. I think it's rather, rather fun. And Lawrence of Arabia with his Middle Eastern wife. I mean, it, it's still fantasy. But you see, fantasy is very much part of B.G. Wenxue. You know? And fantasy is not exactly what you'd call serving the people. Actually, I think it is, but I mean, it wouldn't be regarded as such. I think most of C.C.'s books would have been severely criticized in mainland China. She would not have survived, frankly. And she did, here's Julius Caesar with Cleopatra. And, but she was not... She was not averse to being serious. She wrote a very powerful poem after the, uh, the Tiananmen massacre in, on June the 4th of 1989. She wrote one of the finest poems um, expressing her grief at the barbaric way in which the students were mown down by the, by the, by the People's Liberation Army soldiers and tanks. A very fine poem. Now, so that, that, that's one aspect of what I call Hong Kong's BG Wensphere. Now, but it's, it's a very rich field. And um, another book that we chose, that we chose for the series illustrates another dimension of B.G. Wenzel, what, what I call the literature of sentiment, you know, the literature of feeling. And that's very much part of um, the Chinese tradition. In fact, this book called Guo Ping Chang Ruzi by, by a couple of very charming friends of mine called Liu Fan and his wife, um, Esther Li, this book is directly descended from one of the most famous examples of B.G. Wenxue, the Fu Sheng Liu Ji by Shen Fu, which dates to just after, just after 1800. And um, in fact, they, they quite, the authors quite deliberately um, mention this, this, this descent. Now, um, what kind of a book is this? Again, again, like so much B.G. Wenxue, it's, not, it's the kind of book that some people would not take seriously at all. Um, and some people wouldn't even like it very much. You know, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a work of, it's a personal memoir of sentiment describing in, in, in very straightforward terms, but very beautifully, um, uh, what we would call a late life romance between two people who meet after having had each of them unsuccessful marriages. And late in their lives, they kind of find each other and fall in love. And the first chapter is just basically an account of them falling in love, writing letters to each other, very romantic. It's all, it's all I, how much they love each other. And I mean, some people reading this are embarrassed. You know, I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry to say, I feel sorry for them that they should be embarrassed because, you know, why should one not express emotion, you know, in literature? And it's ideal in this particular form of the sort of 
descended from Fush and Liuji to describe the joys, the joys of their falling in love and getting married late in life when they've both, in a sense, given up, you know, and then, and then suddenly they find each other and they have a wonderful romance, it's all whirlwind romance, it's all, it's all absolutely lovely. And um, here's the cover of the Chinese edition, and here's the cover of our English translation. Now, and here's, here's Leo and Esther, a most delightful couple, and here, here, here they are young, late, earlier in their lives. And Esther herself is a very talented uh, painter. And this is a book of her, of, her, of her paintings. She's also someone who suffered from crushing depression. I mean, depression is, again, is a subject that some people find embarrassing. I don't. I think it's terribly important to discuss things like that. And I'm, I don't think people should be afraid. I don't think it should be a taboo subject. And Esther has suffered intensely from depression and was driven on, on, on more than one occasion um, to, um, to try and commit suicide, I think on four occasions. And in this book, towards the end, the mood becomes very dark because she talks about depression, about the grip depression has on you, the way it takes you into a dark world from which you cannot escape. And, um, and then she describes in graphic detail how she tried to commit suicide, unsuccessfully, I'm glad to say, but I mean, really, really, really um, harrowing, a harrowing description, very powerful, I think. Again, she, she's not afraid to break the taboo, to talk about depression, to talk about suicide, and then to try and share her experience with other people so that they can also conquer the dark spirit. And, um, and this is what, um, and, and, and uh, their friend, you see, Leo and Esther have a very, a very lovely friend called Bai Xian Yong, who's a very distinguished Taiwanese um, writer, famous for writing fiction and for his championing of, of, the, um, of, the, of, the, of the opera, you know, Mu Dan Ting, the Peony Pavilion. And, um, and, and Bai Xian Yong got to hear about this, this, this adventure of theirs to write down their memoirs, and he encouraged them to publish it. He was the one who really said, this is a great thing. You've done something wonderful here. And he wrote a little preface for them. And he was the one who really encouraged them to go ahead and publish it. And, um, and then, you know, we got hold of it. And um, these two very lovely young ladies, Carol and Annie, um, agreed to um, help. They, 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 they wrote, that they did the initial draft of the translation. I was very fortunate, again, as with um, CC's book, I was very fortunate to be able to recruit a young, a very talented young translator from Australia. And on this occasion, um, these, these young Chinese who were also in Australia and who came to a symposium, um, I recruited them to, to write the draft on which I then, which I then edited. And um, I think this is the motto at the beginning of the book, which like, it, it, it announces the theme of the whole book. And I think it's a wonderful thing. It says, it is such a good feeling to love somebody, you see. With an open heart, you can enjoy the love given you by another. And the more you love, the more love you yourself give, the more you have. And this is where um, Esther uses this word, to turn yourself upside down so that you're empty. And I, I insist on calling it to open your heart, you know, and it's a very powerful idea. It's almost religious, you know, it's, it's, on, it's and although, although her religion in the end is Buddhism, it's about opening your heart. And um, when we try, this is, this is the contents of the book, you see, it starts off the first chapter, Liang Di teaching about how they fall in love when they were, when they were on the two sides of the world. I mean, Leo was still teaching in America, and Esther was still living in Hong Kong, and they're writing to each other, sending faxes, telephoning, and then occasionally able to meet, have fleeting meetings. And then eventually, chapter two, they, they get married, and they're terribly, terribly happy. And um, again, it's a kind of, um, it's a memoir, it's a record, very, very simple. But to this, Esther appends her own little treaties of how to be healthy, how to yang sheng, how to cultivate your health. It's, which is a very lovely little, uh, uh, like an appendix. And this is, this is again, typical of the sort of BG Wednesday nature of this book. And then they go back to the past when they were in Chicago, 
when she was still married to somebody else and Leo was, was a young academic. And so they're looking back on their, on their earlier history and then bringing, bringing the events forward to Hong Kong and um, traveling around from Hong Kong to Singapore, to Taipei, to Shanghai. So the four and five are really about travel and about how their relationship matures and becomes more, more interesting. And, and they go into some depth. And then chapter six is where we, we, deep, we jump into the deep end and it's about depression. And it's about Esther's journey through hell, depression and suicide. And then it ends on a, on, on a bright note because they, 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 they managed to find the light. They managed to find a way of living, of living everyday life. Um, for, for its little pleasures, to doing things together. Nothing pretentious, no sort of great, um, you know, manifesto, but just, uh, but just uh, the pleasures of everyday life. And that's how the book ends. Now, um, we, um, because, because they were my friends, and because I managed to recruit these two young people who also got to know them in New Zealand in 2018 at a symposium, we were able to, embark upon this project in a spirit of true friendship, you know, what I call Zhiyin, which I've always said is the highest aspiration of translation. I mean, one is so blessed when one can conduct a translation project in an atmosphere of true friendship. It, it, it brings with it an incredible abundance of good energy, good chi, you know, and that's what we were so fortunate with. Um, and um, we, um, I want to get to, this is by Sen Jung, you see, he is the one who really encouraged them to, to publish the book and um, wrote a very nice preface, which we translated. And then these are the two young ladies. This is Annie Ren, Ren Luman, and this is Carol. And they, they were the ones who, who, who labored to produce the first draft. I mean, very hard work. And then, and then we, went, we went over it together. And this is my study, what I, what I call the San Chuen Tang, because I have three dogs, you see. And I was very fortunate, this is before COVID struck. They were able to come over and we would spend hours sitting at, the, sitting at my desk, going over sentence by sentence and, and thinking about the meaning of this, this book. And this is the outside of my, of my San Chuen Tang. And there are my San Chuen. And um, we, um, we really found that what was interesting was in the process of translating this book, we really found that the theme of the book, which is with Dao Kung Siji, opening the heart, was one that we could, we could actually apply to our own work as translators. And on many occasions, we, we felt the need to open our hearts to the challenge of translation because we were, we were translating a book about feeling, you know, about love, very simple, no, no complicated, um, pretentious kind of, you know, theoretical um, blah, blah, blah. It was just about falling in love and being happy and then struggling through depression and trying to trying to master it and they, these are emotional truths and and throughout what they were insisting on was the truth the sincerity of their love and they still talk about that they're still very proud of that and we as translators had to often we would just sit there in silence and look out of the window and try to open our hearts you know in order to in order to be able to vibrate to the to the um, rhythm of their quest, what I call their passionate quest in, in search of love. And that was a very, very moving experience, I must say. And as I said, the last line here, this memoir of theirs provides a unique personal testimony to the human spirit of the world of Hong Kong, because the whole thing basically began and ended in Hong Kong. Hong Kong was the place and what, 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 what Leo calls one of the high places of the multicultural world. And um, now, so that's how we worked on, on, on the first draft. And then when it came to um, the, finally, the final revised edited version to be published, that was my responsibility as the editor. And I felt very strongly that there was something, something we had to add there was some quality about this book that wasn't going to come across to the Western reader unless we added something. So what I decided to do was to, was to, was to work in um, passages from, um, from some of the old BG 
writings in Chinese to show the Western reader about what was in the background. In fact, I was reminded of something that was said by William Yip, Yip Ye Weilian, who was actually Leo's supervisor when he did his PhD in America. And he once talked about what he called the echoes in the Chinese reading experience, coming from the distance, trembling, ready to speak to us, a huge symphony playing inaudibly to our inner ear, converging into a confluent dense music. Now that's very, very um, high flown kind of theoretical stuff. But I think what he means is that in Chinese literature and, and indeed in BG literature, I think almost, but, but especially, um, but, but in poetry and in, in every kind of literature, in, there's a huge amount of, of background noise. These are the echoes. There's so much Chinese writers go, always go back to the past. There are echoes of the past in everything they write, you know. And um, every Chinese poem contains allusions of many, many kinds. And what I felt with, with Guo Pingtang Ruzi was that there was a huge background noise of the kind of BG tradition, you know, especially things like Fu Sheng Liu Ji, but other books as well. And I had the idea of, of adding them in. And this was a kind of creative license, if you like. But I just thought that by, by popping in a few of these, you would give the reader, the Western reader, an idea of what it was that was in the back of their minds when they wrote Guo Ping Tang Ruzi. And um, I did that. And I added, I added things from, you know, from Shi Shuo Xinyu and from all sorts of, um, all sorts of Western, all sorts of Chinese um, memoirs from the past. And um, there's an example, for example, here, you know, the ones in red, I didn't print them in red, but the ones in red are the ones I added in. And then at, at a certain point I started, I started to think, well, am I really allowed to do this? Is this creative license really permissible? So I wrote to Leo and I said, look, I've just had this idea. I gave him an example. I said, what do you think? Do you feel we're interfering? Do you feel we're intervening too much? And I have to say, he was, he was very, very kind. He wrote back and said, I really like your idea. Go ahead, do it. You go ahead and do it. I think it's wonderful. So we ended up really with a kind of expanded version of this book. And, um, and we, um, I think we were all quite pleased with it. Anyway, Esther certainly said she was and Leo was. And I think all of us, the whole project was, was really a, a tribute to a kind of friendship. It was a kind of yin yuan, you know, which, was, which really began when we all got together in early 2018 at this symposium in New Zealand and um, established a kind of connection. It was a real connection, you know? And so it drove us, it provided the chi, you know, the fuel for this whole project. And now, now when I look back on it, when I pick up that book, I feel a sense of real joy to have been able to participate in sharing this experience of theirs, this true, um, this true expression of their love with the world. And I'm so, I'm so very proud of that. It's one of the books that I'm particularly proud of in our series. Um, of course, I, I'm very proud of the, um, the Teddy Bear Chronicles. I think that's a wonderful book. But in a different way, I think this is also, and they both belong into that, they both belong into that very mixed bag called B.G. Wensway. It's not, it's not sort of serious, serious, heavy, heavy literature. It's indeed almost light. And some people would say it's too sentimental. I don't think so, because there's a, there's a real truth there. What is, what is the difference between sentiment and sentimental is that sentiment is true, can be true, whereas sentimental tends to be a negative word, meaning um, not very deep, you know, rather superficial. And there's nothing superficial about this book. It is, a, it is a work of sentiment, but it's certainly not sentimental. And I feel that the translators had to put aside all preconceptions about, about writing, about feelings, and just be brave and just go for it, you know. And we did, and I'm pleased. I'm very pleased with the result, I have to say. Now, um, when I say that B.G. Winsway survived in Hong Kong very well, of course, I mean that. And of course, in the mainland, it didn't survive, except in a few very rare examples. And usually in this case, the famous example is, is, the, is the, the veteran writer Chen Zhongshu and his wife Yang Jiang, more famous perhaps as the translator of Don Quixote. But, but um, they wrote, I mean, I mean Chen Zhongshu wrote this enormous collection of jottings, which is called Guan Zui Bian, um, which is a kind of um, a certain type of Bi Ji Wenxue, a very, very, a very learned 
almost showing off how, how great his learning was. But it's typical, it's, it's typical of one sort of B.G. Wenxue, sort of academic B.G. Wenxue, if you like. And then Yang Jiang wrote a very charming account of their, their life during when they were sent down to the countryside, you know, Xiaofang, and um, called Gan Xiao Liu Ji. Now that, that of course, that even, even the title echoes Pu Sheng Liu Ji. So there were a few rare examples of people writing B.G. Wenxue, but normally they were people who were so senior and so important and had such strong connections with, the, with, with very important people that they could kind of get away with it. But on the whole, it was in Hong Kong that it flourished more than in the mainland. Here's, here's the young Chen Zhong Shu wearing a rather beautiful overcoat. And, um, and you see, when, when, when we look at something like Guo Ping Tang Roads, I want to say um, that one should beware because, you know, if in the mainland, a, a work like that would, 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 would invite um, the um, attacks an attack from the official critic. For example, when, when the young poet Bei Dao published a novel called Bo Dung in the early 1980s, he was viciously attacked as, as, as somebody who was betraying the revolution, you know. He was, it was um, disillusionment with revolutionary ideals and his work stood for the perfection of man's spiritual nature. My goodness, what a terrible thing. Attempting to substitute universal human nature and humanism for the correct Marxist worldview. Well, one could imagine um, you know, a critique such as that being aimed at something like Guo Ping Tang was indeed, and indeed being aimed at um, the Teddy Bear Chronicles. You know, How can writers be so um, reactionary as to write about things like this when they should be just you know, writing about um, the proletariat? And uh, I think one has to constantly remember that, that Hong Kong has been very fortunate until, you know, very recently anyway, very fortunate to be protected from all of this ideological kind of pressure. And that has allowed certain things to flourish, like BG, what I call Hong Kong's BG ones here. And I put a lot of this into, into the book, what I call the best China. One of the, book, one of the books, the six books in the series I edited for the Chinese University Press. I'm just going to have a, a quick drink, so bear with me for a moment. Now, I should explain the meaning of this title, The Best China, because my mother always would say, um, if so and so is coming to tea, we better bring out the best China, meaning the finest teacups. I, I still do that myself. I did it yesterday. I got out my best teacups and saucers, side plates, milk drug, teapot, for some very kind friends who came around. And, and, and that was something you did. You, you brought out the best China. And I'm using, I'm using that word, the best China, to describe a similarly special collection of prose items that demonstrate the best Chinese tradition of free thinking and creative writing. So that's why I've called this particular book The Best China. I've called it The Best China because it contains a BG Wenzhou. It's, it's, it's the very best kind of free and creative prose. And there are many examples in it. And I'm saying that during since, since 1941, um, that Hong Kong, so far from being a cultural desert, has been, in fact, a veritable oasis, nurturing the delicate shoots that express the best, the truest China. Now, I've, I've, I, I want to have a quick look at a very interesting example of B.G. Wenzhou, which is in this book. And it's an essay, it's an essay by, um, by my old teacher, Liu Cunmen, who was very much part of Hong Kong. He, he, he escaped from, from China in about 1948 and ended up in Hong Kong earning, earning a living as a teacher and, and a casual um, writer of film scenarios and plays and so on, and ended up finally in the, in the, in the mid-60s emigrating to Australia. But all his life, he remained very closely linked to Hong Kong. So I, I, would, review, I would view him as a, a, an intellectual who is part of the Hong Kong diaspora, the, the spreading of Hong Kong people all over the world. And um, he once wrote an essay called Tsa about which I've translated as cutting grass, and he gave it to me to translate. He wanted me to translate. I was his, if you like, I was his disciple. I owe him an enormous amount. He was my, 
he was my real enmen, my teacher and my 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 mentor and my my great friend. And uh, he died in in 2009, and this is now 2021, and I still I still feel his absence every day. He taught me a huge amount. And so I undertook to translate this essay of his. And there's a picture of him writing. He wrote, he wrote tiny Chinese characters, almost impossible to read. One would have to use a magnifying glass or reproduce them with a photocopier enlarged. Otherwise, they were virtually impossible to read. And I wasn't the only person who thought that. And here is, in fact, a shot of the first page of the manuscript. And you can sort of see. I mean, you can't tell the size because I haven't got a, a scale there, but these characters are tiny, tiny, tiny. And he would make lots of corrections, you know, sometimes in red, sometimes in, in black and blue and so on. And, um, and then he sent, he sent it to me and I, had, I, I would spend ages laboring over this essay. It's a delightful essay. It reminds me a little bit of Cici's The Draw because it's really all about cutting grass in, in his garden with a, with a, with a lawnmower and the frustrations of cutting grass, but full of little literary references, full of humor. You know, it isn't serving the people, let's face it. It's just, it's just evoking humorously uh, a moment in his life when he, he had to struggle with his mowing machine to try and cut the grass in his little garden in, in Canberra in Australia. I've actually been, I've helped him many times to cut the grass. And, and um, he's not, a, he was never a very practical person. He was a typical Wenren, a typical man of letters. And, um, but he manages to spin this out over many, many pages. I mean, I'm not going to read it all to you because it's, it's, it's very hard to read all of this. It's quite long, but take it from me. It's the most humorous, delightful, touching little, little essay. It's an essay about, um, his experience trying to cut his lawn. And he begins, but he begins it, you see, with a reference to a, a great scholar, Huang Kan, and how he was reading his journal. So that's a way of like throwing in a kind of very learned reference at the very beginning of the essay. And, um, and then he ends up talking about his buying, buying his machine. And you see here, usually you may have to give it more than 20 turns without getting the slightest peep out of it. I think I can remember having so much trouble myself trying to get my, my mother's lawnmower going when I was a child. They're very frustrating. It's not particularly old. I got it from a friend who'd owned it for only a few months. We've been using it continually for over 10 years, but its problems have shown no signs of abating. It goes on like this in a very sort of it's the kind of thing that would be published in Punch magazine or the New Yorker, you see, and um, occasional quotes from, you know, from neo-Confucian philosophers or from the Shi Jing, and um, references to Lu Xun and so on. But uh, it's 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 too long to read to read all of it to you. But it's in the book. It's in the book. The best China, the whole thing. Um, and he wrote it in 1986. Now, this is the kind of casual essay that would have had great trouble surviving the various political campaigns of the People's Republic. And in fact, has only really flourished in Hong Kong. To a certain extent, it has flourished in Taiwan, but I think especially in Hong Kong, where journalism has also been a contributing factor, a, wonderfully, a wonderful tradition of journalism in Hong Kong, the people who write columns for the newspapers, you know, these were great, these were fine writers, essayists. I mean, I could list, you know, half a dozen straight away off the top of my head, who basically contributed essays to Ming Bao, to um, Ping, Ping, to, to Apple Daily, which unfortunately no longer exists, and even to even to the um, the party controlled papers, you know. Um, but I mean, it was a flourishing business and people earned money by, you know, a lot of people earned considerable um, royalties from publishing this kind of BG Wenshui. It was a thriving business. Another writer who I want to draw attention to is the very wonderful Yu Guofan, Anthony Yu, who again had his roots in Hong Kong. I mean, I, I met up with Anthony many times in Hong Kong. He loved the place. I mean, I think the last time we met was in, he took us out to, um, 
to dinner at the, at the Peninsula Hotel because he was a real bon viveur, unlike Professor Liu. Professor Liu was, was not a man who really enjoyed um, a good meal or a nice glass of wine, but Tony Yu was a man who, he and his wife Priscilla, both of them delightful people, and I was greatly privileged to be a friend of theirs. They enjoy life, you know, they know a good wine, they know good food, they travel. When they travel to Venice, they stay in the best hotel, when they travel to Paris and so on and so forth. And um, my last shared experience with them was in, was in Hong Kong at, at the Grand Colonial, you know, Peninsula Hotel. And, um, and, you know, Tony would have a message for the chef, for example. And he, he enjoyed life in that way. And he, he enjoyed his leisure. He was also a very talented pianist. He enjoyed playing music. We played piano duets together. And we were very, very close friends. And um, he wrote a lovely piece for um, the China Heritage Quarterly, which was edited by Jeremy Barmey, called, called um, Days of 15 Shelley Street. And Shelley Street was, as you know, is a street in Hong Kong. And um, in, this, um, in this little essay, which is a very casual memoir, written in English, actually. So in this case, he was writing, he was writing um, B.G. Wensway in English, because his English was very good. And um, he contributed it to, to the, to the um, uh, online China Heritage Quarterly, edited by Jeremy Barme, about a period in his life when he, when he was living in Hong Kong with his grandfather. And, he, and this is just a very short extract. During that unusual and unusually happy period of more than six years of living with my grandparents, because his parents had left Hong Kong, his, you know, his father was a very high ranking um, uh, person and Saturday was always a special day. I wish he knew, my grandfather, I wish he knew that I now have the opportunity to teach occasionally a class on the classical Chinese lyric and to share with my students here in Chicago many of the things he once shared with me. I hope he is pleased that I have kept what he had given me, a precious part of himself. So it's, it's a delightful, it's also in a sense, literature of sentiment, because he's, he's, he's remembering a poignant memory of his grandfather and how his grandfather kindled with him a love of Chinese poetry and taught him to write classical Chinese in his youth. And a lot of it is descriptions of the little restaurants they went to to have lunch. And um, again, it's, the, it's, what, it's what the French call the aperçu, the, the, the perceptions of life, the fleeting nature of life. And it's very much, very much part of, of the B.G. Wensway tradition. And um, again, Anthony Yu was somebody who, who would have not fared well in, 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 in the People's Republic of China. I mean, his sympathies were with, were with those who stood for freedom, those who stood for creativity. And um, he was a great authority on Hong Lo Meng, but he would have suffered a very similar fate to that of Yu Ping Bo, the great Hong Lo Meng scholar, who was persecuted mercilessly in the 1950s. And luckily, Anthony was able to, um, to spend most of his life teaching in America, but always, even when he was in America, or when he came to visit us in Australia, his real roots were in were in Hong Kong. He he was a Hong he was an, another member like Professor Liu, a member of the Hong Kong diaspora. That kept alive a certain tradition, what I call the tradition of B. G. Wenxue, because many of the people who wrote B. G. Wenxue in China's history were also scholars. They were also artists. They were fine. They were fine people, people of, of, of refined um, sentiment, people of enormous what we might call xiuyang, you know, self-cultivation. And uh, again, they were not subjected to the pressures of ideological pr uh, persecution. They were not ordered to do things a certain way. They did things with, from the heart. They did things that they wanted to do. They did things for their own pleasure. They did things that, arise, that arose out of their moments of leisure. And as I say, leisure is a crucial part of the culture of BT. And leisure is something that was cultivated in Hong Kong. It was not something to be ashamed of. Now, um, so these, these two people, Anthony Yu and Professor Liu, 
belong to a certain generation and they've both passed on now and both of them are people I, I enormously miss. But let's move to the present and to a, a, a character who will be well known to all of you, um, whether you pronounce him in, 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 in Guoyu as Tao Jie or call him Chip Tsao or sometimes Toket. I mean, this is a remarkable writer who, again, personifies a particular strand of B.G. Wenxue, which is the, that of the, um, the contemplative essayist, the person who takes an essay and uses it to, to, to indulge in a, a wide-ranging contemplation of life. And um, I've chosen a piece of his that I think is a remarkable um, piece. Um, now, I think at this point, if, if William, if you're able to read us a little bit of this in Cantonese, that will help set the scene, just maybe from this page, if you're able to just tune in with a few words of Cantonese, is that going to work? Okay. Nilauchitai 不幸一一挨過去,已邊流話。然而當時人恨此離世前最後一刻,每千年前回百感集生,腦部若仍健全,此時他會到一許多私藏被處之個人事情。Let's do one more page because I think we've got time and it's great to hear it. If you could carry on a little bit, maybe not the whole of this page, the first two sections, yeah. Okay.此刻他知識大限的門檻在眼前,或處於錯中交集的恐懼與悲傷的黑冤邊緣,甚或悲恩交集,視乎一生修為,或於此一走入分層的疏河世界替淚難捨,或一切已生厭倦,眼
Fortune alone determines how matters will unfold. Although for some, the passage in extremis may also bestow, bestow a certain karmic bounty earned through personal cultivation. Some will have already been reduced to a vegetative state, will be quite unaware of their surroundings. Yet even then, that flickering green light on the screen by their bedside keeps providing bodily measurements of blood pressure and pulse, indicating that everything is somehow still normal. Others, though their functions may by now all but have ceased, and though they appear to all intents and purposes to be insensate, may yet be aware of their surroundings, may even be listening to what is being said by those gathered in their presence. It is at such moments that friends and relatives who have come to bid farewell may lean forward to whisper some final words. At such a moment, as the dying slip towards death's ultimate door, some may find themselves face to face with countless memories and a host of confused emotions. If they still have any consciousness left, this is perhaps the moment when they recall a host of secrets long hidden of words never spoken out loud. At that moment, as they see the final threshold looming before them, they may feel as though they're teetering on the edge of a dark abyss, beleaguered by a legion of fearful and sorrowful thoughts, a disparate mixture of emotions, crestfallen sorrow, leavened by gratitude and joy. At that moment, all are as one, united in a mood of reverie. Some may cling tearfully to lingering memories of the evanescent pleasures of our fleeting world. Others, weary of their inexorable decline, may indulge in some incandescent vision of what is lying in wait for them beyond the portal of death. They may hear the voice of the Buddha approaching them, chanting from the sutras. Friends and relatives gathered there at the bedside, still mired in the earthly realm, oblivious to these inner visions unfolding within the dying soul, chatter away, unburdening themselves, sharing with loved ones things they consider to be of importance, offering as consolation last minute words and thoughts which are in truth a balm only to themselves. They may perhaps believe that what they're saying will help the loved one pass on peacefully, but most of these well-intentioned expressions of sentiment are in truth vacuous and insincere especially if the one to whom they are being offered is a person with any quality of feeling or profundity of thought. If in life these dying persons have been serious thinkers, in particular if they were convinced atheists, at the moment of their parting they will invariably experience a deeper sense of solitude and sorrow than most. They may raise their eyes heavenward as the celestial gates are thrown open and in that very moment cast aside all residue of the vanities of life or they may look down into the roiling fires of the pit of hell and feel regret for a futile life of piety. Perhaps the only thing they really want at this moment is to embrace their last precious moments on earth in peace and quiet. Despite the boundless luminous vistas that may be presenting themselves, maybe all they really want is to be able to comb their hair and arrange their clothes in peace. Yes, in peace. And then, having reached their final great moment of realization, then they will be ready to take their one last small step within the great universe of life. Of course, the dying may be made of coarser stuff. They may be fixated on the worldly possessions bequeathed in their last will and testament, or on their children, or on the luxuries and gustatory pleasures they have been, they've most relished over the years. These beguiling memories will tug at them still, even as they fall away into the darkness of oblivion. Then there are those rare individuals who after a lifetime spent in obduracy may suddenly see the light and experience an epiphany of sorts. But anyway, whatever the thoughts coursing through their minds, they are none of them capable of speech. They're all motionless in the grip of death. There on the borderline between the quick and the dead, at that place of, I can't read that because it's something in the way. However urgently their loved ones and friends may try to summon them back to the world of the living, their words are of no interest and the dying cannot say what they are thinking. With that, this is why at such moments, those who have come to take their leave 
should be particularly mindful and measured, both in word and in deed. Who is to know? Who can say? I once went to bid farewell to a respected elder, a learned man. I found him alone on his sickbed. I pulled up a chair and sat at his bedside. We gazed at each other, speechless. As he lay there, I couldn't tell whether he knew I was there or even knew who I was. Whatever we might have had to say to each other had already been shared over the years during our many late night conversations. What more was there to say? We looked at each other. We didn't need words. We could convey it all with our eyes. He let out a sigh. I remained silent. Eventually, I stood up, took his hand in mine, held it warmly and let it go. Then I took my leave. As I closed the door, I paused for one last look. I could see that he had, I can't read that either, something me out with his gaze. He'd seen me out with his gaze. I departed. It was so very hard not to look back one more time. Leave taking is part of life. It happens as the hurly burly of the world falls away and the transcendent realm of the unknown unfolds. I walked on without looking back. Outside, I gradually became aware of the stars twinkling above me, unfeeling in the hugeness of the evening sky. I thought of him lying there beyond that wall, setting off on his journey between the realms of darkness and light. I felt his gaze bidding me farewell. It was a vision, an immense and infinitely receding shadow, joining us together under the vast vault of heaven. I think that is such a fine piece of writing. I think it is one of the finest pieces of contemporary BG journalism. This is where journalism and the BG kind of merged together. And some of the finest examples of BG Wednesday are to be found in the journal, in the journalistic columns of the Hong Kong newspapers. And um, in conclusion, I wish to return to the, the question I began my talk with, uh, what is literature? And a fine example of the traditional Chinese perception of literature is in a poem by, by the, the, the not very well-known poet Shu Wei, from the Qing Dynasty. Now, I think again, William, if you wouldn't mind reading each of these verses in Cantonese before I read the translation, I would really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Again, this is this is a, a traditional poet trying to explain what how he perceives the function of literature. Heaven and earth possess a breath of life, this is the chi, you see, which never dies, which ever will endure. And man, twixt heaven and earth, receives this breath. And that is all. What need has he of more? Again, if you could read this for us. <laughs> Yes, I think there's something gone wrong with the text there. Anyway, and yet without much conning of the books, he'll never penetrate the inner core and only practice in the craft of verse can help him rise above the workshop floor. The penetration yields at first but bitter fruit. The sweet delight comes when he learns to soar. The poet issues forth in rhyme and song, impelled to do so by this very breath, the chi, you see. Its lively inner working fires his soul, clay piled on clay is, is in verse his living death. And concluding with... Thank you. Art knows no contract binding lord and serf, no recipe, no rhymer's pedigree. The vilest matter is in art transformed by virtue of an inner alchemy, and pretty wording falls away to show truth's 
plainest and most potent mystery. So you see, this is this is a kind of um, sorry. I, I should let, let, we should finish it. Okay, carry on, please, William. Yeah. 经已三百篇，鬼已十七史，终已五千年，行已真性情，作成大道理。The poet strings his loom, the classic odes his woof, his warp the chronicles of kings. He casts one eye along the avenue of time, the other turns in space a thousand rings, and then he pours the magma, heart and soul, and fashions out his shape of higher things. 其气从通生，生则恶可以。The breath of art is born from void. Once lit, it never dies. Its power is infinite. Thank you. So you see that that really um a late expression, but it goes right back to the earliest idea of literature being inseparable from qi. From the from the Tao, you know, it is it is a function, a very high function. Literature occupies a very high place in the Chinese traditional universe, and that place has been preserved in Hong Kong. It has not been subjected to a barbaric、um, de deconstruction of literature, a devaluation of literature as being a kind of materialistic、um, function in in order to serve the the, the people, so to speak. And、um, I want to conclude by. By evoking three really fine people and their views on the role of of leisure in 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 creating、um, this kind of literature, the, the 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 civilized light literature of BG, and of course, first of all, I want to mention Lin Yutang in in the in the, at the appendix of his book,、um, the importance of living. He、um, has a wonderful glossary of terms, and he 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 looks at the word xian, meaning leisure. As in leisurely conversation, xian tan, leisurely sentiment, xian qing, and leisurely leisurely pleasure, xian chu, and and he writes both the art of conversation and the art of writing good prose came comparatively late in the history of human civilization because the human mind had to develop a certain subtlety and lightness of touch, and this was only possible in a life of leisure. And this is the new tongue saying this. I am quite aware that today, from the point of view of the communists, to enjoy leisure or to belong to the hated leisure class is already to be counter-revolutionary. But I am convinced that the aim of true communism and socialism is that all people should be able to enjoy leisure. That the progress of culture depends on an intelligent use of leisure. This is this is the philosophy underlying、uh, B. G. Wenxue. And another very fine writer. This is the、um, the Belgian、um, uh, scholar and translator and critic Pierre Rickmans, who used the pen name Simon Leys. In Chinese, he's usually referred to as Li Keman. On on the subject of leisure, now what he wrote was this: From the earliest antiquity, leisure was always regarded as the condition of all civilized endeavors. Leisure was not only the indispensable attribute of a good life; it was also the defining mark. Of a free man, the very concept of artes liberales, liberal arts, again embodies the association between cultural pursuits and the condition of a free man. Samuel Johnson was merely stating the evidence of common sense when he observed that all intellectual improvement arises from leisure. And to conclude with. With the words of one of the authors in our in our series, Leo Li, Leo Fan,、um, this this spirit of leisure was something that permeated Hong Kong, which made it into a very special place, which is the place that he regarded as his spiritual home. And he wrote, "I consider myself to be part of a rootless generation. If I were to find my roots, they would be somewhere spread across this kaleidoscopic Chinese-speaking world. Hong Kong is just one intersection within that world." On the surface, it—that's Hong Kong—seems highly commercialized, but that is a very deceptive impression. Beneath it, Hong Kong is far more complex. It is one of the high places of the multicultural world, and I think that's a very strong statement about the true spirit of Hong Kong. It's one of the high places where the true values of literature, art, and leisure 
have been treasured and have been saved from the um, from the from the pressure of external ideological attack. And that is that is really the message of what I want to say today. Thank you very much indeed. I'll stop there. And I welcome I welcome questions in the chat room. I'll do my best to answer them. Thank you very much. And thank thank you, uh, Richard, for saying that all the, some of those books I mentioned were your favorites. Anyway, they're mine as well, of course. And um, and um, rereading Beatrix Potter, I just I'd forgotten how wonderful she was. I also watched the recent movie about her called Miss Potter, which I found I found very moving. And I also watched the movie about A. A. Milne, actually, and I thought that was very good too. Um, not not the Disney one, but the one that was um, made um, in in the UK. It was very a very good um, a very good movie, yeah. And of course, Rudyard Kipling is immortal, yeah. All the other chats are about that super technical problem, yeah. Now there was somebody who wanted to see slide one four six, but I couldn't see anything of any interest on slide one four six. I think his name is Hu Ying. If you still want to see another slide, let me know. Oh, here we get here. Here are some um, <laughs> here are some interesting. Okay, uh, someone called Sun Kai Tong. They're very interested in CC. I find that she observes the world and writes from the perspective of a child and uses a lot of metaphors, which makes her works full of fun and thought provoking. But at the same time, her works are permeated with elements of a heavily colored with Hong Kong culture. I wonder how you would deal with text when there is a cultural gap between the original and the target. Well, very good question that of course, the teddy bear book doesn't really come into that category because it's not really about Hong Kong. It's about teddy bears. It's in the, it's a, it's in the world of the imagination. But some of her, some of her um, stories and longer novels and novelli are, are very, very Hong Kong. I know, and I haven't actually worked on them myself. I've, I've only worked on some of her stories. There's one called Gan Ma, The Cold, which I helped to translate some years ago. It is, it is a very Hong Kong story, but there's nothing, there's no particular problem in, in that story because it's a very Western view of Hong Kong. Um, I think I could imagine there would be um, examples where one had to um, fill in, I'm a great one for filling in background, you know. I think, that, I think that a lot of translations of Chinese literature have failed because they, they take for granted a kind of background knowledge. Um, they, take, they take for granted the background cultural knowledge which simply Western readers don't have, you know. And um, I think that that was the case for um, with Hong Lamong, for example, I mean, our translation of Hong Lamong adds in a huge amount of stuff, you know, just general cultural information, which is just, you know, shamelessly added into the text. And some people hate that. I think it's absolutely essential. Otherwise, people just, they can't understand what the hell's going on in a Chinese, Chinese work like Hong Lamong, unless they're given a helping hand all the time, you know. Um, anyway, uh, 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 that, that's about, yeah. And then, um, Oh yes, are there any new bright spots that are appearing to give you hope for the future? <laughs> I don't think I can answer that question. I don't see many bright spots anywhere on the horizon in Hong Kong at the moment, apart from people's iPhones, you know, flashing them, you know, when all else fails. I think that I think we have to wait and see. I mean, it took them it took them a while to destroy Shanghai after 1949. It'll take them a while to do the same in Hong Kong. But don't get me started on that. I am very pessimistic. Yeah. Um, and thank you. I'm glad you got the, the bilingual edition. Yeah. Um, could you possibly talk about how to make sure the target reader can get the effect of this light literature? Hmm. Well, I don't, I don't, I'm sorry to have used the word light literature. It's, it sounds rather disparaging. I mean, I think I think uh, uh, the lightness of touch that doesn't necessarily make it light. I mean, you know, people like Hilaire Belloc and G.K. Chesterton had a very light touch, but they were writing some very serious essays. And indeed, um, lightness of touch, that's where you get the, 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 the traditional mood of, of, of BG. I mean, someone like, I'm, I'm not the best person qualified here to talk about it, but Joe Zoran has that lightness of touch. He writes, about, he writes about very serious things, but in a very light way sometimes. It's a matter of style. You know, there was, there was an 18th century coterie of people who had the motto, seria luda, which means I play with serious things. They were a group called the dilettanti, and they they were very they were very well educated writers. 
but they they were aware that if they if they started to write a very heavy heavy kind of prose, no one would want to be bothered to read them, you know. And um, you know that's what's so wonderful about about someone like um, CC is that she writes she has a lightness of touch which is very very um, special, and um, makes her makes her work extremely easy to read, but not easy in a kind of in a kind of super, it's not superficial. It's not at all superficial. Hmm. Now I think I've I've missed out a few. Let's have a look. Um, oh yes, this is Annie. You would like me to talk about Professor Liu and Anthony? Now, um, okay, because I had to rush through those and I couldn't read it because the screen was taken up with the black box. I think very suitably called the black box actually. Um, yes, I mean. Professor Liu's essay, Tsa, I mean, he delighted in sending that to me to translate because it was so difficult. And he wrote it in tiny, tiny characters. I mean, to read Professor, I've got about 150 letters from him. They're all written in minuscule characters. I think he deliberately did it to tease people. And you have to read it with a magnifying glass. And then he writes a particular kind of Chinese, which is really extraordinary. I mean, he, he, um, he was a great, a great disciple of Zhou Zoran, actually, really. And, um, and that essay is very, very difficult to translate because it's so, it's so whimsical, it's so funny. It makes, it makes, it makes fun of all kinds of things. And then, and then it sort of, um, at the end, it leaves you with a sense of, of reverie. It's a kind of, it's, 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 it is a reverie. I mean, it very much in the style of some of those um, pieces that you and I translated, Annie, from the Dunn brothers, you know, it's a kind of, um, which they were definitely BT Winsley. I mean, it's a kind of um, a way of looking at, life that is that is kind of um sees life as transient as like a dream and and then you and you sort of go into it and you come out of it and you and then you touch on daily life you touch on little details about your lawnmower how you can't fix it but really you're all the time it's a very Taoist kind of way of writing and Anthony you very similar I mean Anthony you a great a great um student of religion and philosophy and he wrote this charming lyrical essay about his younger days with his grandfather in Hong Kong, with memories of going to little restaurants, memories of, of little uh, moments that he shared with him, movies they went to see. I mean, on the one hand, you could say it's simply a, a piece of personal reminiscence, but it, it's written with such um, sensitivity and humor as well. Both, both Liu and, and, and Anthony have a terrific sense of humor and it comes through in their writing. Um, Yes, someone, uh, Richard, you said, if there's something I had to go over quickly, could I spell out a bit more? Yes, well, I think that's a good point. Um, I, I um, well, there's quite a few more questions coming in. Um, let me deal, deal with one or two of these because they're quite specific. Um, someone wrote, what does high place mean? Well, when Leo, I can't remember the Chinese now, but when he says that Hong Kong is a high place, it means it's a kind of, um, a high place, you can talk about a place of pilgrimage, a high place, the high place of the Buddhist faith is such and such a place, or it's, it's a kind of, um, it's a very special place, a very distinguished place, a very, a very um, supreme um, location in a sense, you know, it's almost religious. Um, I won't talk about my relationship with Sung Ti because I've talked about that before. Um, I don't think, I think I managed to spend enough time on CC's bear book, um, of course, I could have read many more of the essays, but they're very delightful. But I mean, you know, one can't read everything. I managed to show you quite a few pictures. Um, perhaps didn't spend quite enough time on Leo and Esther's memoir because there's so much in it. I mean, it's such a mixture of things, letters, letters they exchanged. It starts off with, you know, 20 or so pages of simply love letters. How oh, I love you, darling. I just want to kiss you and hold your hand. It's very sweet, actually. I mean, some Chinese readers find it really obnoxious. And, and, you know, it's very interesting. It provokes some pretty negative responses from the Chinese academic world because they, they can't cope with emotion, you know. They find emotion rather difficult to handle, you know. But I really admire the fact that these, these people, especially Leo, who spent his life in the, in the mainstream academic world at Harvard and so on, um, is able at, that, at, at the age of 60 something to kind of come out of it a human being, you know, and not afraid to say how much he feels. And, um, and uh, so I think, I think that first section is very moving. I mean, it's very convincing. You have an incredible sense of sincerity in the way they write about each other. And then of course, 
the, 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 the last part, which is incredibly hard to read, is a blow-by-blow -blow account, not only of depression, but of her several attempts, unsuccessful but serious attempts, to commit suicide. I mean, very detailed what means she chose to use, the drugs she took, the weapons she used, and so on and so forth. I mean, it's pretty heavy stuff, but it's very, very convincingly real. And I think that she was encouraged very much by Bai Xian Yong to write it all down because it was important. And very few people write, very few people will touch that, sop, that topic, you know, and that's very powerful. And then in between there are little, little things like, she writes a whole section on um, nutrition, you know, yangsheng, and, and what, how you can improve your health and your life by eating the right kind of food and herbs and so on, which is just a little insert, you know, typical BG, it's just a little, a little um, miscellaneous insert about um, a sort of self-help thing in a way. And um, one of the things I very, I personally like very much about Guo, Guo Ping Chang is, is the number of little um, sketches of their friends. It reminds me of, you know, a bit like the Shushuo Xinyu of the contemporary um, international sinological world, because they'll just, you know, there's a great moment where he talks about um, his friend Joseph Lau and um, makes fun of Joseph Lau um, for um, preferring Playboy to play Penthouse or something. I mean, they're little, little jokey remarks about some of the people that they, that, who are quite well known in the West, I mean, in the scholarly world. And it's, it's very sim symptomatic of the fact that Leo was emerging, you know, like a butterfly from his, um, the, the soul deadening life of, a, of an academic. And that was, what, that was what really drew me close to him when I was in Hong Kong from 2011 to 2013. That was when we became very close friends. I could see him really casting off the shackles of academic conformism and just doing his own thing. And I really admired him for that. And I really admire the way that comes through in the book, that he wants to be, you know, Leo, not Professor Leo Lee. You know, he wants to be Leo and he wants to lay, lay bare his heart, his thinking, and establish his own way of being, you know, that isn't dependent on his reputation as a professor. And I find that particularly interesting because I first met Leo in 1986 at a very high powered conference in Germany when he was at the height of his kind of, you know, um, reputation as a, as a straightforward academic, having, having published books on the May the Fourth Movement and Lu Xun and so on. And he was a heavy hitting sinologist, you know, and I was a very, I was just starting, I was very young. And I, of course, I was slightly in awe of him. But when I later got to know him some um, 30 years later, he was such a, such a more interesting person, someone who was really fun to be with, who would far prefer to talk about music or art or film than, than to talk about um, boring academic subjects. And he, he's a, he was an inspiring example of someone who was able to branch out late in life into, into a more interesting way of talking and writing. And um, I admired him for that, and, he, and I kind of learned a lot from him in that way. And that comes through in the memoir, and um, it's, 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 it's a shining theme, really, in that book. And the way they tease each other is also very endearing. I don't think Esther would have been um, tolerant of any of that rubbish, you know, a very strong-minded woman who, who, um, who, who provided Leo with a perfect counterweight to his, um, to his own um, intense intellectual pursuits a fascinating book. I, I thoroughly recommend it to anybody, really. It's a real, it's a real antidote to the kind of cliched um, Chinese, you know, memoir, the Chinese novel, if you like, it tends to be rather pompous and self, self, um, self promoting, you know, this is not at all. This, in fact, is a very, very honest, sincere account of, of their life together. Hmm. Um, I think there's some more men. Let me have a look. I'm not going to talk about foreignization and domestication. I'm sorry. The very words make me want to leave the room. Um, oh yes, adding the commentary. This is you again, Annie. I think I think adding that, adding those. Yeah, it was a form of a kind of form of. I mean, commentary itself. I couldn't agree with you more. Is a form of BT. I mean, the Chinese more than any other uh, literary tradition I know really went in for commentary and and like to scribble on the side of books. And I mean, it's famous that Chairman Ma used to get these priceless 
uh, old editions out of the National Library and scribbled all over them because he felt that that was somehow going to make him into a Wenren. You know, it didn't succeed because all he wrote was rubbish. But I mean, um, I think this tradition of writing commentary going right the way back, you know, is is it precisely a branch of BG literature? Exactly. Yeah, couldn't agree more. Um, now there's someone here called Joshua. When I translate Hong Lamang, I think the cultural specific content, e.g. idioms, can be understood by the English. Well, of course, it's always a problem. I mean, um, any, any idiomatic expression, I mean, you've got to choose between um, um, keeping the kind of, you know, um, the Chinese-ness of it, so that it sounds very weird and Chinese, and trying to make sure that the reader knows what it bloody well means. Well, I mean, you end up probably having to do a bit of both. I mean, each case is different. I'm I'm very hesitant to generalize. I think you have to um you have to take you have to take each case on its merits, really. Um sorry to be so so useless in replying to your question, but I think you have to. I'm always, I always have the reader in the front of my mind. And I sometimes sometimes you cheat, sometimes you do things that are rather naughty, and sometimes you you just hope for the best, but I, I, I think I probably would um, um, go for the go for the um, over over explaining rather than under explaining. I know that, for example, someone like Bill Jenner disagrees with me profoundly on this matter. But then he disagrees with me about everything, and he thinks Lin Yu Tang was an absolute rascal. And I mean, you know, but I mean, who cares about that? I, I think that you've got to do your best to help the reader get through to the meaning, whatever you do. Whatever. I mean, when I translated the scenes where where Jia Ba Yu um, tries to learn to write Ba Gu Wenjiang, you know, I decided in the end to put it all into Latin. And some people think I was just showing off, but I wasn't. It was because I felt that writing Latin prose was the nearest equivalent I could think of to writing an eight-legged essay, you know. And I I I spent the the best years of my adolescence writing bloody Latin prose compositions, you know, every week. And so I knew what it was about. I knew I could do it. And I think, I think in the end it works very well, but it was a kind of, it was a leap in the dark. And sometimes you have to take risks. And I'm not afraid of taking risks. I don't mind. I mean, I, I couldn't care less what people say. I want to give my reader pleasure. I want to give them understanding. I want to give my author my very best shot at, at allowing the author to actually speak to a new audience. And whatever I can do to make that possible, I'm very happy to do it, you know. To add a bit of this and a bit of that, you know, hmm. not a very helpful answer, I'm afraid. Um, I think I've more or less covered all the questions you've got here. I'm just going through them now. I think CC is one of those writers um, which um, who um has really had trouble being being recognized outside the Hong Kong context. I mean, it was Sung Chi who really spotted her, you know, way back when I was in, when I was working with him in the early 1980s. He was the one who really said to me, she is really worth reading, you know. And um, and he he's he was a very he was a superb judge of literature. And he could see her, he could see what she was at, what she was doing, you know. And um and um I learned from him that she was somebody worth worth taking very seriously. I wouldn't mind, you know, um, helping somebody else perhaps to um, to do some um, more CC translations. Diana Yu has translated a very long book by her. Hmm. I think that's pretty much covered all the questions. I don't think there's any new ones coming in. There's a, most of these I'm looking through all about um, the technical problems which we did manage to um, um, sort out. So I'll probably just leave it there. So we're, we've almost reached time anyway, unless there's any last minute, last minute questions. I think I'll just say goodbye to you all and um, look forward to um, another talk, the last talk next Saturday, which as I said, will be about how people set about teaching translation talking about translation and of course actually translating. And to give you a, a brief foretaste of, of what I will be talking about, there was a very, for me, a very memorable occasion, some, I don't know, 25 years ago in Hong Kong, when I was invited to be the discussant at a, at a conference on translation, the teaching of translation. 
And there were two very distinguished speakers. One was a man called Eugene Nida, who of course was one of the great authorities on Bible translation. And he gave a talk in, in, the, in, in the first half. And the other guy was called Peter Newmark, who was a great theorist. And um, I, I, I was well known as an enemy of translation theory. I've always been totally opposed to translation theory. But I thought, I thought Eugene Nida seemed a very nice chap. And in the interval, he and I were standing outside on the terrace, looking out over the harbor. This was at, this was at uh, Chinese University. And um, I thought I'd better let, he was quite old. I thought I'd better let him know that I was going to be uh, attacking Chinese, uh, attacking translation theory in case he had a heart attack or something. So I said, I said to him, oh, Professor Nida, I thought I should let you know that, you know, I don't believe in translation theory. And I think it's wasted on the young Hong Kong students because they basically, um, you know, they don't understand it and they just want to learn how to translate. They want to practice translation. They don't want to read about, you know, um, Catford's linguistic theory or Pete. And, and he turned to me and he said, um, I couldn't agree with you more. He said, I absolutely agree with you. And he said, and young man, I suppose I was still young. And he said, um, I want to share something with you. And he turned to me and he said, I'm getting married next week. <laughs> and he told me about his new girlfriend. She was an Argentinian dancer who he'd met in um, Amsterdam. And he just wanted to tell me all about his love affair. And I said, well, thank you so much. And then we came to the, the moment of truth because after the break I had to give, I, I gave my piece, which was a vitriolic attack on translation theory. And then the, um, the, the chairperson turned to the two speakers and said, well, would either of you like to comment on Professor Minford's um, attack? And um, that was what I was wondering what, um, Nida would say, and Eugene Nida leant forward and just said, I totally agree with what my young friend has just said. I totally agree with him. I couldn't believe it because he's known to be a translation theorist. And yet he agreed with what I said. And then of course, Peter Newmark lost his temper, started screaming and shouting at me and telling me I was an abusive old fool and blah, 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 blah. And I was asked if I wished to reply to Peter Newmark. And I said, no, because I couldn't see the point. He'd already, he'd already disgraced himself in public really. And um, so I, I will be, I won't just, also, I won't just be giving you anecdotal stuff. I will be talking about what I believe is the, is, the, is the only way to teach translation. And when I went to the Open University of Hong Kong, I created an MA, which was called Learning to Translate by Translating. We removed all traces of theory. We just got students to translate, 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 translate. And that was my one a chance to, to, to put into practice my own belief. But I won't just be talking about, I'll be talking about some individual translators, individual <clears throat> people in Hong Kong who promoted translation. I mean, for example, I will talk about Wang Siu Kit, who was a good friend of mine, who was, a, who was the main person at Hong Kong University translation program for years and years and years, and a very wonderful translator himself. And of course, Martha Jung, I want to talk about her. No, no account of Hong Kong translation would be complete without, without talking about Martha and Jane Lai, these, these very important people in Hong Kong. I want to put them into an overall context of, and of course, Stephen Sung himself and, um, and how, they, um, how they affected the um, development of translation in Hong Kong, which is one of the great places in the world for, for, for the study of translation um, because of its unique position between China and the world. And um, so that's what I'll be talking about next time. Anyway, I won't, I won't give it all away now. And um, so I look forward to, to seeing you. And, I, and someone's asked me why I hate translation theory. Well, I can explain it next time, yeah. So thank you very much. I'll, I'll, I'll say goodbye now then. Goodbye. Have a nice, um, have a nice weekend. Mm.